Episode 19, Royal Flush. Introducing Richard Colton on the BTS Creative Academy podcast. With me, your host, Martin Colton. Let's start with a clap then. Do you want to join me? No, 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 you just (laughs) have to do one. I worked in TV and film industry for around about 30 years. Um, which always surprises people because people always go, how on earth have you got a career that's about 30 mm-hmm. years long? You, surely you're no older than 28. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I... Uh, you are looking younger at the moment. There's something... A, are you doing a health thing at the moment? No, it's just the sun. No, Is just, it just, just the sun? You just got a bit of a tag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it's, I'm always trying to live. Really. But no, it... So I spent 30 years straight out of school, straight into this industry. And the thing that I realized straight away was experience is everything. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you've come out of university or you've come out of school and you want to be a director, um, whereas I've just said, yes, just do it, there is something to be said for um, gaining a little bit of knowledge, gaining an understanding of what it is and where you want to go to in other in other ways, because um, I now I'm now an independent filmmaker, mm-hmm. and the problem independent filmmaking has is it's full of untalented, um, and I don't mean this in a nasty way, but it's full of untalented, inexperienced people in the top jobs, right. and the reason why they're untalented and inexperienced is is because they've never got any experience or learn any talent from anybody else professional anywhere else in the industry. And of course they make 101 mistakes and then on the second or third film, they've corrected those mistakes. So it's a shortcut and it works, but it's not the best way to make a success in the film industry. Mm -hmm. As I say, I I spent 30 years, I worked in post-production mainly. And I worked my way up to being an editor in things like London's Burning, Bill, Casualty, Holby City, you know, every blue light drama at eight o'clock on, BB, on um, British TV. You, I did it. You've been there, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so take me back to that, that beginning then of your, the beginning of your career. Yeah. Before we go to where you are now. Like, so this, from... Obviously, we haven't really said we're brothers, have we? But I think we well, can I, get, I popped I it think in. Any, but, uh, I, think any, any, <laughs> I think it's there might be There might be a kind of mirror image thing. Similarity. Going, similarities yeah. going on here. Mirror image, yeah. not quite. <laughs> but not quite. Maybe yeah. like a house of horror mirror. <laughs> I don't know who for. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're, so I know a bit of where, where you've come from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but let's hear it from you. Where okay. where did this all start? So, this obviously, journey? I I was I loved film and TV ever since I was a kid, mm-hmm. and um, when I was growing up, I had various things I wanted to do for a job, as we all do, you know. But it was always on the creative side. I always was a very very creative kid, and um, but it was also I had a. I had a bit of a tough childhood because I was bullied at school. Right. And creativity was a great outlet for the bullying. It was, I could, I could do it on my own. So, you know, um, and so what the things that then started to mold me were the things, the influences outside. So if I had a a good home economics teacher, Mm -hmm. I suddenly, I wanted to be a chef. You know, I had a good um, woodwork tutor. Suddenly I wanted to be a carpenter. You know, and and the thing was, the th- as great as those things were, they weren't really satisfying me. But then come home, sit down and watch on a six o'clock on BBC Two Star Trek. Mm. And I was in my element. I loved it. And I just wanted to know, not just, you know, about the TV, but how they made it, what made them choose those shots, why why that story came about, so and my mum said to me just one day, look, why don't you work in TV and film? And I just like, uh, can you? Mm-hmm. She went, yeah, yeah, of course you can. I said, yeah, but we don't learn about that at school. And she said, so? And I was, from that moment on, I just went, yeah, that's what I want to do. 
on a working teenager. So how old was you when Oh, that teenager, came young. Mm-hmm. Um, 13, 14, something like that. So from a bad time in your life, the, the bullying, yeah. came something... Yeah, I would no, no, good. because that's almost giving credibility to the bullies. Right, okay. Which I never want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, lot, lots of people have said, oh, look, you know, I bet you've proved those bullies wrong. No, I never thought about them after I, I left school. Um, but I know that because I didn't have a great school life, I, um, when I did have moments of joy provided by good teachers, mm-hmm. That I suddenly wanted to, I, I latched on to what they were teaching. And it was always in a creative arena. There was a few teachers. There was a great maths teacher, I remember. And there was a, a really good primary teacher, a primary school teacher, I remember. Um, but but it, particularly the ones in the creative areas, I was like, oh, that's what I want to do then as a job. But it wasn't because I, mm-hmm. I, I never had the passion for it. And to be successful in TV and film in any area, whether it's acting, art, and de- art design, costume, makeup, editing, post-production, music, you have to be passionate about it. If you're not passionate, you won't succeed. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, I'm very, very passionate. And of course I want to. A lot of people aren't that passionate. You can see it in their eyes what they're what they want to reach for, and this isn't a criticism, but what they're reaching for is fame. Yeah. It's, and it's different. It's not passion. And, you know, what I call passion is that you'll do it even if you're not getting paid for it. Mm-hmm. You'll do it um, just for the love of it. And it will give you a joy um, to be involved in something. Even if it's not your project, it will give you a joy doesn't mean anything to anybody else you're not even going to show it off to anybody else you just know inside you just go yeah i was part of that that's to me what what passion is so i had this huge emotive feeling that i wanted to be in the film industry and the tv industry i had no idea how to get into it none at all and i went to um sixth form college Oh, first of the very first thing was when you do, um, I don't know if I had this in your day, because there's a bit of an age gap between. Yeah, yeah. Um, 12, 12 years. 12 years. And, um, but I don't think they had, I think they'd stopped doing it by mm-hmm. your time. But we used to do work experience. I did do work did experience. Did you work experience? Yes, because yeah, okay. I did it with you. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you not remember that? Remember. <laughs> you don't remember, you no, don't no, remember no. that. So I did work experience when you was work, on London's Burning. Oh, okay. And you, oh, I got you at free that. free meal studio was my right. work experience, and you saw and I did that, and I like that's a really groundbreaking. It's funny you don't remember that because no, that no. is that's such a, a huge thing. For that's me. a huge moment right. in my life. That that two weeks of being with you at work, uh, and yeah, that that shaped me <laughs> that two weeks. So for you to be like, what are you talking about? That's quite quite oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, don't even remember. My English teacher showing up at the gates of the studio because she didn't believe that well, got you, that you got me that job for work experience. No, no. She came. She came on the train from from Harlow into London. Right. And she turned up. Spoke. The security wouldn't let her in because it was a film studio, studio okay, and yeah. you had to go to the gates to say no. He is. He is he here. Is here. And yeah, we had to. Problem. We had a meeting in the security hut at the film studio and. You don't, I remember, don't that. remember that at all. No, no, no. no. But yeah, no. That was that Gosh. was a very informative, a poignant, pivotal poignant moment. moment for me. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's really. <laughs> and it meant nothing. And it meant nothing to you. That's really interesting. <laughs> no, it didn't. I'm sure it, it didn't. Meant it didn't just time, mean, but it's, it's. It didn't just mean something to me. <laughs> it, it didn't just mean something to me in finding out what I want to do and what I want to be about. But it yeah. was also like looking up to my older brother and, and going. Did. This is what he's doing, and this is like uh, so. he, this is how his life is, how he's shaping it. And again, like talking about how you didn't have the greatest time at school, I, I didn't have a good time at school either, and there was no path given to me at school. Right. But then, as soon as I saw what you were doing within those two weeks, 
Right. I was like, oh, I need to be part of this. <laughs> right. I need to, maybe not exactly the same way. We have yeah. gone slightly different, but those two weeks were the moments that were like, right. Hold on, this is yeah. I need to well, be going this yeah, way. Yeah, it's interesting. Oh, okay. Well, it does kind of go back to what I was saying about my work experience at mm-hmm. secondary school because my uh, work experience tutor said, "What? What would you?" Um, like to do work experience. I said, I want to work in TV and film. And she went, oh, gosh, I don't know how we're going to achieve that. Mm. And then two weeks later, she came back and she went, right, I've got it. She said, you're working in a shop. You're working in Essex discounts. They sell TVs <laughs> and they develop That's film. That's like a cash converter, like a Essex, secondhand. Essex discounts was like Curry's, but, uh, right, okay. but it was only in Essex. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, had one in, it was, they had one in Harlow and they had one in Loughton. Mm-hmm. Now, I was so disheartened hmm. by it. I was so disheartened. But I went and did it. What it was, what it was good for me, though, was that um, after that, I gained uh, sort of um, experience enough to go and do part-time jobs in electrical um, shops and so on, mm-hmm. which if you're going to be in the uh, TV and film industry, you have to have a second skill under your belt because – as you know, like if you as an actor, yes. you spend more time being a waiter mm-hmm. than you will be as an actor, or yeah, whatever yeah. your second skill is, you'll spend more time doing mm-hmm. that. You know, it's just the way it is. You yeah. know, until you get lucky, because it is all about luck, and get something um, big. You know, but anyway, so I did that, and then um, I went to sixth form college because my school six one closed down that year and there a whole new array of courses opened up for me there's tv studies there was film studies there was photography and if it wasn't for that i wouldn't have gone Mm -hmm. but i went i went and did these courses and i didn't do very well in the class courses at all because they were they were educational about the subjects i loved and and that I wanted to do it rather than talk about it. Yes, yeah. So I, it bored me, and I get bored in tr- quickly. Mm-hmm. So, but the but what was really interesting was all the other people that were on the course were as passionate about these subjects as I was. And there was a guy there. Um, I think his name was Martin, actually. Um who I got on really well with. And um, he said, look, I've just got a runner's job with um, an animation studio. They're looking for other runners. I haven't asked anybody else yet. Are you interested? And I didn't even have to think about it. I just went, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think the term runner is used quite so much now. So explain for anyone listening what a runner is. Oh, is it not? Okay. Yeah, I think they've uh, changed it to executive <laughs> coffee maker or something like that <laughs> so basically a runner is a, a gopher yeah a gopher this and a gopher that uh I, it's the like you say a tea boy mm-hmm. coffee boy it's uh that's not sexist that's just that's what we called them then yeah. um because um but it's it's the somebody that's on set predominantly although they're in our other areas of production as well to assist in every department to go and make teas and coffees for people when they need them to, to do the donkey work, the leg work to, you know, because it's their training ground mm-hmm. and it's the best way to learn and train. Um, and I needed that training. I needed to see, cause I, people used to say to me, okay, you want to be in the TV and film industry. What do you want to do in the TV and film industry? Cause there's like 150 jobs. Which one of those jobs do you want to do? And of course, everybody, every kid you ask that's doing TV or film studies or, you know, wants to make a music video, whatever, they all say they want to be the director. Mm. But a directing is, yes, it is the top job, but it's a small part of the whole thing. Um, I have a, a saying, and I've taken this from other people, Filmmaking 
is one of the only artistic forms that is pure collaboration. Okay. And what I mean by that is if you're a writer and you're writing novels and writing books, it's all your own ideas. Mm -hmm. If you're a musician, generally, it's all your own ideas. Um, if you're a painter, it's all your own ideas, your own craft. If you're a photographer, it's all your own work. It's very solitary when you're doing your thing. But when you're a filmmaker, everybody's involved. And that is amazing. Mm -hmm. That is brilliant because as a director, you have a wealth of talent. You hire people based on what they know, their experience, how well they do. So when you go and shoot something, um, if your DOP says, ah, oh, yeah, okay, and you direct them to do it one way and they say, but I've got another way, and that way is better. You're a really foolish director if you don't listen. Mm -hmm. you, because, and there's a lot of directors that don't listen. Yeah. <laughs> because these people, that's why you've hired them. You've hired them because they know their job better than you know mm -hmm. their job. So, anyway, so when you're a runner, you're learning what all these other jobs within a production are. And, um, so to be offered, without even looking, a runner's job so early in my life, I grabbed it, grabbed it with both hands. But the really lucky thing for me was um, it was for a studio called Richard Williams Animation. Now, many people won't know the name, but what he was famous for was doing the animation on Roger Rabbit, who framed Roger Rabbit. Right. Now, the backstory to that, um, is that um, if you remember the film, it was probably one of the only animated films to have Looney Tunes, mm -hmm. Warner Brothers, and Disney characters all in it together. It was the original crossover movie, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the original. Yeah, yeah, and that, and it was mixed with live action, obviously, mm -hmm. and because it was a crossover. The studios had a little bit of infighting about, well, who's going to do the animation? And so it was decided that an outside animator who wasn't connected to any of those studios would do it. So he got all the sort of the stencils, if you like, for the characters. And then he did the animation for so that they so that Bugs Bunny could interact with Porky the Pig and so on because they were from different studios. Oh, so a Mickey Mouse could interact mm -hmm. as well. So he made such fame from that because he won an Academy Award for it. And one of my very first jobs and one of my longest running jobs while I was working there was to polish the Oscar. <laughs> was it? Yeah. <laughs> so I've held an Oscar. Yes, yeah. And I remember even at that age, uh, I was about, Gosh, I must have been about 17, 18. I remember holding an Oscar and saying, yeah, one day. One day you'll I'll have. I'll win one of these. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, you do the, the thing where you look to the nearest mirror. <laughs> and you go, I'd like to thank. <laughs> when no one was around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But See, I, 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 I met an Oscar. <laughs> uh -huh. I was around someone's flat that was an um, independent filmmaker that made a short film. Okay. And won an Oscar for the short film, but I made a decision not to pick up their Oscar and do that okay. because I was like, I don't want that with someone else's Oscar. I want that with mine. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, I'll look at it. That's Although, nice. But, I'm a, but I'll wait for the moment. <laughs> but I'm a big believer. I was then, but I didn't really. I didn't have a name for it back then. Mm -hmm. But now I have. I'm a big believer in manifesting things. Okay. And because I think that's part of creativity and part of a creative's brain. Mm -hmm. is to manifest um, a direction where, where you want to go yeah. or something. And that was, for me, that's part of it. That's me pretending that I've got this Oscar mm -hmm. was me going, I will have that. You yes, know, it's yeah. not one day I might, because mm -hmm. might, it doesn't really cut it. So, yeah, anyway, um, so I did that. And while I was there working on that, I watched what all the different areas of, all the different jobs within a, um, 
an animation studio. And that's my very first experience of editing. Because I would sit in there and watch these guys, with the great big reel-to-reel bits of film, with with um, um, Stanley blades and sellotape. So it was real hands-on. It was hands-on, sticking mm-hmm. and gluing and so on. And then, you know, and they would cut things out of the film. You know, editing is one of those things where it is about as much about what you take out as much as what you leave in, you know. So they would chop and change what had been drawn. All this stuff that had been drawn would be cut out and left on the floor, (laughs) left on the cutting room floor. So it was really interesting to me to see how they thought and how they processed stuff. And once that was created, once they got what was called the cutting copy done, it was sent to Soho, and then Soho processed that and turned it into one singular piece of film without any joins in it. So anyway, that that ten year came to an end. The, the, the production wrapped up. Um, it was for a production called The Thief and the Cobbler, um, and it had been made for so long that it was dedicated to Richard Williams' newborn son. And um, when I worked on it, his newborn son was the production manager. <laughs> <laughs> so it had been going on for a long, long time. Yeah. And he'd ploughed every penny of his like earnings from working on Roger Rabbit and mm-hmm. so on into this, creating this film. Anyway, I, um, I uh, finished my thing on that and I was like, right, I, I want to stay in the industry. I've learned a lot. And the only place I knew where to go was Soho, Soho, central London. I knew that there were all these what we call facilities companies in Soho. So I literally, with a whole load of CVs, just went around and around all these companies looking for another runner's job. Um, And knowing that the runner's job there would be slightly different to what I'd just been doing. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working for three different facilities companies in central London and each one they did a different job but it was it taught me quite a lot about um about the different types of productions and and how the facilities companies are used by those different productions so you know because you've got tv drama or you've got feature films or you've got documentaries you know just just to name three yeah and and they all have a different post-production process and that you know as a layman the people outside are in i don't think they understand that i don't think some of the people in our industry understand that (laughs) but there is different processes to go from filming or during filming through to the end but we're talking about the end bit because that's what the jobs are looking for um and then the very last runner's job I worked for was a company called Video London. And Video London were a sound studio. And what they did was they they had three main three main jobs there. Um they would do a um they'd basically do the full dubbing mix of the soundtrack of the film. And that involves voiceovers so they would record voiceovers they do foley sessions so that involves so they the technical term they would call it because foley is very american is footsteps Mm -hmm. so almost every single piece of a feature film and a tv program especially drama is replaced the sound is re-recorded so people walking down a, a cobble street They've got a bit of cobblestone. Because amazingly, it never actually sounds like they're on cobblestones, does it? Right. When If they try and record it on set. Oh, on set, no. Yeah, exactly. if they try and record it on the sound on set, because, it never... It, no, if they because, try and record the, the rain on set, it never sounds like rain. There's a, the, yeah, the reason for that is, mm-hmm. is because the sound man's job is to make sure he gets the dialogue. Yeah. That's all he cares about. Mm-hmm. If he gets the dialogue clean, clear then everything else can be done in post-production. But if you're missing the dialogue, it's very hard to replace people's voices. But we do. We do this thing called um, ADR, 
which is the other bit that this sound studio would do. So uh, ADR is is something like um, automatic dialogue replacement, something like that. Can't quite remember. But anyway, um, the idea is the, an actor goes into a booth mm-hmm. and re-says their lines on a microphone. But in a booth, it's got a different atmosphere around. You know, the sound coming through this mic now will sound totally different on an iPhone microphone outside. Mm-hmm. And it will sound totally different to a boom mic or a tie mic mm-hmm. in the middle of a scene. So for an A, you don't want to do much ADR recording. So that's why a sound recordist concentrates on the dialogue. Because everything else can be replaced convincingly. Voicing, voice recording is a little bit harder. Mm. Anyway, so they did these three jobs. It was very, very interesting. I met a lot of very interesting people through, through working there. A lot of famous people came in. One of my um, all-time favourites to come in through the doors was Norman Wisdom. Um, he was a childhood hero of mine watching his films. And to know he was coming in that day, and as the runner, I was given the job to meet him at the front door and to bring him in mm-hmm. to do his um, voiceover for a documentary about his life. And uh, my boss called me up to his office and said, look, Richard, Richard dear boy, now... Got a very, very, you know, his name was uh, Clifford Judge, this guy, great guy. He's, and uh, he helped me out a lot in the industry. He said, dear boy, dear boy, got a very important job for you today. I was like, okay, yeah, all right. He said, uh, now, you know, Norman Wisdom, so Norman Wisdom, he's coming in today. Well, I, I would like you to bring him in, give him the tour, and show him to his studio, Studio 3. Oh, okay, that's great. He said, look after him. That's all I want you to do today. You're just to be with him. It's like, great. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Right. His car will arrive at half past 12 outside. So don't wait for the car to arrive. Be outside waiting for the car to arrive. Gotcha. So anyway. Um, I was just about to leave his office and he went, oh, one other thing. He's a very old man now. So, you know, help him if possible whenever he needs. Doors open, things open. You know, look after the guy. Gotcha. Got it. Right. So I'm nervous as hell now. I'm <laughs> yeah, really, course, really you nervous. You just had all that for on you. Yeah. So, all right. I am waiting outside and this black Mercedes pulls up. I'm like, oh my God, this is him. So I rush open. But the door, I don't get to the car door in time. And he opens the door himself and gets out this frail old man with a walking stick. And I'm like, oh, no, what do I do? Because I, I, do I go up to him? Do I wait for him to get to me? What do I do? Mm-hmm. So I, I fumble around with the front door to the building and I, hold, I make sure that sticks open. And then I turn around and look at him again and he stops. And he wobbles and he drops his cane. And I'm like, oh my God. And then he falls forward and does a complete Willy Wonka where he does a head over oh, heels. He did. He did. <laughs> yeah. he did a head over heels. He stood up and he went, ta da. And I'm like, uh, uh, just a, perf- a non stop performer. And, the, and from that moment on, he comes up to me and he's like, everybody expects me to be Norman Wisdom. Mm-hmm. I am Norman Wisdom. He said, and I love to make people laugh. And I said, we <laughs> scared the crap out of me. <laughs> but he said, but, he's, but that's what he was. He, he, and, and that's like, that was, he's probably the most famous person that's met up to my expectations. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, um, I showed him around and, and, Took him to the uh, recording studio and everything, and he was. He How was did that great. feel to to meet him? Then you're oh, because awesome. he was massive. He was massive in my childhood as well. But, right, you know, our grandparents showed us the films, yeah, didn't yeah. they? And yeah, he's a British British icon. British icon. Yeah, yeah. 
amazing. Yeah. But there was a few like that. There's a few that I can't mention um, as well, you know. So, mm -hmm. and I learned over the years as well not to get disappointed by people now, not to put such a expectation on, well, just because I like them in X and admire them in Y, that they must be that person because actually they're not. It, no matter what they do, they are a character. Mm -hmm. They are there purely and utterly, no more, no less, for our entertainment. Um, so anyway, so I, I did that that job for a while and that was interesting and i went from being a runner to working as an assistant on in a particular a sound assistant for one of the studio so that was my first promotion up um and part of my job was things like track laying where you have to put lay sound effects from a sound effects library onto a timeline for the sound mixer to choose which ones to use um to copy off and, and make duplicates of because remember everything's on tape in these days hardly any computers were used we did have computers but it makes me sound really old saying that but mm -hmm. but the computers were a kind of like um a secondary piece of equipment we didn't trust them enough to do the main job yet so but it was great because I learned why we did things that you now, that computers emulate. Because computers emulate what the heart, like, so for example, there was Dolby machines. Sound went through a Dolby machine and was EQ'd to Dolby standards mm -hmm. on this machine. And you had a little screwdriver that you had to put in and, and twiddle to, to set to certain uh, levels. and computers copy that um you know so when you're eqing things they've copied the setup that that dolby machine did so and, and editing as well now editing on software has copied what you do on on film and video um which is what led me on to my second job so i working as a runner led me to being an assistant working as an assistant i a new piece of equipment came into the studio and it was called a Lightworks. And a Lightworks was um, one of the very first non-linear editing suites. And we're talking like £200,000 worth of editing equipment back then. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was a dedicated computer with a dedicated bit of software. But what it had on, the, on it was a piece of hardware which emulated a Steinbeck um, film editing machine, which was a lever with a push button to stop and mark and cut. And it was the simplest, best piece of editing equipment that's ever been created on the planet. Didn't do titles, didn't do special effects, didn't do grading. It just did editing. Mm -hmm. So cutting dissolving moving things around basic editing so you came into the industry at a time when big change was happening yeah mm. yeah my my career started in film and moved over to computers and these um this this computer i i got by clifford again clifford said to me he said i need you to learn how to use that computer we're going to send you on a film editing course and a Lightworks course. We want you to learn both, and then you will be their assistant. And any time that editor goes, oh, I do this on film, how do I do it on the Lightworks? You can say, do this. You can do it so that you keep it running, their production running smooth. So I did that for them. I then did it for um, Sean. Um, Sean Bean's production, um, Sharp. Sharp. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did three or four series of that with them. But because I was working under the other company, I never got a credit as an assistant editor. I was, I was hired out by that company, pretty much like a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. But it was great because I was getting experience on all these productions. 
And then I got made redundant because they decided to get rid of that piece of equipment. They didn't think that piece of equipment was bringing enough enough. So, and Clifford said, look, don't worry. I helped, you, you know, that was, I pushed your career in that direction. I know I've got to make you redundant because things are tight. Um, I'll get you an agent so you can carry on being a, uh, an assistant. Mm. He got me an agent and within weeks I was working on London's Burnie as the assistant editor. And within six months, no, it will be, within six months I became the top assistant editor. And within a year, they were talking about me becoming an editor, which was rapid fire for it. For it. They, in those days, because mm-hmm. things move quicker now, but back then, um, in those days, that was that was quick turnaround in anybody's career. Mm-hmm. And uh, so much so that LWT, who did the, did the show, got very nervous. And they turned around and said, no, look, actually... Um, we feel this, and the excuse they gave, I, don't, I think, but they said, I, I think we've got too many women, uh, too many men working in post-production on this show. We need a female influence. Mm. So they brought in a young girl who was less experienced than me to edit the shows, and within weeks she got fired. <laughs> so, um, so, I think there's got something to be said about the whole box ticking exercise that the industry does well, it does it, do, it does this it thing. has people at the top that don't understand mm. what the industry is and they want to yeah. they, they want to embrace they're doing it for op- the right op- reasons yeah they want to embrace yeah. opportunity for all which which needs to happen but it at the moment it's uh it feels like it's condensing and stifling the creativity and even stopping it, it in the, some the, parts the problem is is that Creatives are not one type of person. Mm -hmm. If you're a director, one director will see a scene written on a piece of paper and direct it one way, and another director will see a scene on a piece of paper and direct it a different way. The people at the top that haven't had experience through all of the different jobs within a production, they don't understand and they think, I've hired a director, I could get any director to do it. Mm-hmm. So, okay, I've got to fill a quota, so I'll get, I need to get a women director now, or I need to get a black director now, or I need to get, and, and that's great, but they haven't looked at, is that director right mm-hmm. for this production? And actually, Denzel Washington said, said this. He said, look, he said, you couldn't have Martin Scorsese direct Black Panther because there's a lot of black cultural references in Black Panther. Mm-hmm. So you need a black director to do that. And he said, and, and, and it's the same. You, it wouldn't be, you know, having anybody else do Goodfellas would be an issue because... Mm-hmm. That was, that, that was his culture. That was Martin's culture. Yeah. yeah. And this is the thing. You have to have the right director and the right person doing mm-hmm. the right job. And quite a lot. And it happens more often in TV um, for one simple reason. In TV, a producer hires everybody below them. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in film, it generally tends to be that the director has the idea. So they've written and or they've helped create mm-hmm. that initial idea. And so they create it about things they know. So unless it's a big studio picture, then they're going back to people at the top looking for just who's going to fill this, this agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it, it does get sometimes in the way because they haven't hired the right person to do, to do the job. Yeah. But anyway, so it happened to me, um, and the wrong person was, was in my opinion, because it, they took a job away from me, so I believe she was the wrong person. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't resent her, 
having that job. It was a job opportunity for her. She took it. Why wouldn't she? But what I am pleased about is that they realised their mistake quite quickly and then they turned around to me and said, okay, let's, uh, let's have you on it now, Rich. Let's, mm. let's do it. Something quite interesting that, that when I hear you tell this story about this time in your life, for me, so you was in your early 20s at this point. Yeah. I was about 10 years old. And I was looking at you as someone that had pure perseverance right. with all of this. Yeah. That you was just driven. That um, yeah, Even think about when, when you're talking about this, I think about the times that how you would not have any money through these jobs, would you? No. Because you wasn't driven by money. You was driven by wanting to be part of this industry. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I have memories of you doing things like jumping onto the train because it was your only way to, to get there. Right. And I have memories of you working all through the night, five well, nights a week. I still do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but, it, but, but you was, go- was going to get the job done, wasn't you? You yeah. was going to was gonna oh, push I had forward. To prove, with, mm. I had to prove to the industry that, you know, that you was that, that you am, were coming. That, I am, <laughs> that, you that were... I am the guy to do the job. Yeah. And that if I didn't know it, I'd damn well learn it. Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 that they, and that people could rely on me, you know. Um and I've worked for some for some horrible people, but it didn't matter because I was still working within the industry. And I worked for some great people as well. Um, you know, and I learned learnt a lot and made some made some great friends. But what's but one, so, uh, so yeah, so I became an editor eventually and worked with some of the, over the next sort of 10 years, worked with some of the best directors in the industry. And um, these directors, um, you know, they're... And this was in TV. This was in TV. Yeah. yeah. So these, these directors had been around for years and had great stories about because they'd worked with the mega stars now and so on. And they, um, but they also, what they also had was this sort of, um, no matter how old they were, because a lot of them were really old boys now, they had this sort of glint in their eye of youth as well, that they were like, you know, and any time they talked about what they'd done in their past, there was such joy and such, mm-hmm. and none of them had any, any intention of retiring, so but here I am working with these these guys. I'm working with them. They're through everything they're filming. I'm learning because I'm mm-hmm. learning. Well, oh wow, that's why you put the camera there. Oh, that's why you did a shot like that. That's why that edits to that and connects to that and so on. It was, and again, it comes back to this thing of like having hands on and experience. yeah, and you, and you could have never learned that stuff at any university no. or college, could you? Never ever. Mm. Anyway, so. I was working with these guys. I went from there. I then went to um, Holby. From Holby, um, I did a stint on. You'd have to look on my IMDb. There is so many credits, mm-hmm. but Holby Casualty. Holby, I did the Holby, Bill. I did Linda the Plants. Um, you know, a series for them. Dream Team. Yeah, I did Dream Team for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. I've done. Yeah, I became the the, the head editor at Dream Team. Mm-hmm. The, the 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 big thing for me through all of this was that there suddenly became this arc of change, and the arc of change was was quite simply that I was working with these great directors on some great projects, and I was willfully and joyfully putting together their material because it just went together it just you literally just put it into the machine and out would come a sequence Mm -hmm. there was no trying with it because these guys knew how to direct but over the years slowly but surely i started catching up in age with the producers and the producers being as inexperienced as me because i I still classed myself as inexperienced Mm -hmm. Were, hot, were scared of these big-time directors. So they started hiring less and less experienced new directors. 
And these directors were straight out of uni and tr wanting to try fun and great ideas. Maybe they'd won an award for a short film. Maybe. Anyway, but of course, all that was happening was when it came into the edit, I had to fix their shoddy work. Right. And this was happening more and more and more. And was this, do you think this was a cost? Uh, cost cutting exercise no or no no at all. Is it's it, it, an ego driven i thing? think it's the producers were scared of the long time directors right that they were oh these guys know what they're doing and mm -hmm. which is a, a really stupid way to think because it's like yeah they know what they're doing <laughs> yeah. they know what they didn't let them do it mm -hmm. but it was also uh um yeah i suppose there is some cheapness involved um that they want to bring in people that are, will cost less but again it's a foolish thing on a budget sheet because you have to go into reshoots more often and you have to go into mm -hmm. to doing a lot more, um, you know, uh, pickups and things like that because that, the director didn't do it right the first time or you have to get rid of a director and get back in an old director who's just going to charge you probably twice as much now than what he would have charged you in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's, it was a... An, but the thing that initially impacted me was, can you fix that, Richard? We've got this scene. Can you fix it? What can you do with that? Can you fix that? Can you? And that started getting me down because I was like, that's not editing. Mm. That's patchwork. You know, editing shouldn't be about fixing a director's thing. And then you started getting the, the directors that would come in that they thought they were being clever. And they do this thing, what? what I call splatter gun directing, where they literally film every scene from 50 different angles with no idea of, of what they're trying to get out of the scene, how they want the scene to look. And they're just thinking coverage, mm -hmm. get as much coverage as possible. And did that come in a bit because of digital? Because things were yeah, moving for digital that they could capture more they, so they were like let's just get everything let's just get everything mm. producers were telling them to get as much coverage as possible and it's it's lazy because because it's not safe because what happens is two couple of things happen if you're doing 50 takes from any angle from any the cameraman if he's holding the camera he's going to get tired the actors are going to get bored and not going to give their best takes in later takes. The stunts, the timing's not going to happen correctly in later takes. All of these things that you think, because we're not machines, mm -hmm. it isn't exactly the same on every single take. So getting this massive coverage doesn't really help the edit at all. Not at all. Uh, so, yeah, look, you get... You get a handful of get out of jail free cards with lots of coverage, but only a handful. Mm -hmm. So that's where a skilled director knows where to draw the line, where to get enough coverage to get him out of jail if he needs it, but also to keep it because it keep if you if you're the type of director that only does one or two takes of something, it keeps everybody on their toes because they think. I got to get it right on this one take mm -hmm. because he's going to move on. And I might, as an actor, I might not like that. Or as the cameraman, oh God, you know, that I've got to do this move, pull the focus, get a, uh, and I've got to hit that light spot over there. And, you know, and as a, as a cameraman, you're immediately thinking, I got to get this, I got to nail it because I don't want to be the one that lets everybody else down. Mm -hmm. It keeps every, it's a, it's an, a great energy to have on set. But with coverage, with this term, you know, get as much coverage as you can, um, everybody relaxes. Everybody goes, oh, it's all right, because we're going to do another take in a minute. I won't give my best one yet. I'll warm up in takes three, four, five, six. I'll find my feet a bit more as well. So, um, yeah, so, so, all of these things while I was editing, I was going, oh, my God, I've got to watch. Because it affects the editor too. Because you go, I've got to watch 50 uh, takes yeah, now. Yeah, which is how many hours? And, and you just go, <laughs> this is a tiny little three-minute scene. Mm -hmm. And I've got to watch that times 50. Yeah. And you're like, oh. so even then your mind wanders because you're like, mm. I've just seen hang this. Hang on, yeah. which one was, 
the better one, that one or that one or the other. So anyway, so I realized quite quickly that that isn't the way to do it. And then, and then I started not getting, my luck started running out with getting the next drama editing job. Mm -hmm. And I sat back one day and asked myself, well, hang on. Did I always want to be an editor? I found myself getting all these great editing jobs. And now I'm not enjoying it so much. Um, I do enjoy editing, don't get me wrong. But mm -hmm. I was like questioning the job. I was like, right, do I still want to do this? And I was like, okay, if I don't do this, what else do I want to do? And I went, I want to direct. Mm -hmm. Because I can direct. I know, I know I can direct because I've seen it 10 times better than most of those people that are getting hired to do the job that I'm fixing. For. Mm -hmm. So, and I thought about it and I thought, I've got the skill set to do this. I've worked in the industry long enough now that I have, I know how to take something from script to screen all the way through. So why don't I do it? And I couldn't come up with a good answer not to do it. The only thing that I didn't know was the business side of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've made, you can make a film. What do you do with it then? So um, I teamed up with somebody. For me, that was, that was the way to do it. Get I got approached one day by this, this guy. And um, he asked me to edit his film. And this was an independent? This was an independent film. Because you'd started dabbling in independent oh, yeah. editing. So, okay. you, so, so you I'm... didn't go straight from TV no, no, editing no. to directing no. independent film. You, you had this moment of editing independent Yeah, so when I was well. doing the bill, oh yeah, I'll go back a little bit mm -hmm. then. When I was doing the bill, I worked for a couple of guys um, who were making, um, during the heyday of straight-to-DVD independent films, mm -hmm. they were on a roll of making these low budget indie films and because they seem to have a moment didn't they those dvd yeah, they straight did. to dvd they did and movies. it was because dvd was such a mm -hmm. huge market the streaming was yeah around yeah. cinema was failing yeah people had decent not the, the quality of equipment we have at home now but no but people had fairly it was decent. a leap it was a leap ahead all of a sudden wasn't yeah. it in those early 2000s that's right and mm -hmm. and these guys you know started putting together their own indie films and were successful at doing it. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But what they lacked was the professional knowledge I had learned. Right. And they lacked it big time. And um, they came and used the Bill Studios because the Bill would hire out the police station. And they used to have a, a set around the back, which was actually originally built for family affairs, mm -hmm. the soap which was also owned by Talkback TV. And, uh, so it had Talkback all these TV. houses, didn't it? So they and had all these houses. Streets. And, and there, was a, there was a little street there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they would hire out that, and there was a courtroom and a hospital set in there as well. They would hire these out to indie filmmakers, and one day these guys came in and said, look, we're looking for an editor. And they happened to walk into my room first. And they said, what, and ask you. And ask me. <laughs> we're looking for an editor. So, oh, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, what, what, what do you need? And they mm. said, well, we've got, we're making this film, but we don't have an editor to do it. Are you interested? We, we haven't got a lot of money. And um, I was like, yeah, go on then. Because I thought, here's another opportunity to learn. All, every single other editor that I was working with on the bill at that time turned around to me and said, you're mad. Don't do it. You're, you're, you're an editor. You're you don't want that something as lowly as mm. that. It was kind CV. of seen as taking a step backwards. It was, yeah, for qual for quality purposes. Yeah, that's what they, that's how they saw it. I just saw it as okay. Here's a way to learn something else, and maybe just give me a feature film credit of some description, because mm -hmm. all I'd ever done was TV drama, which is sounds like really uh, big headed. All I'd ever done was TV drama, but. 
it's quite easy to get put into a box, isn't it? Yeah. Into a, into a In category. In our industry, yeah. very, very this easy. Is, this is what you do. That's what you do. Can't step outside of that. No. Don't, and don't step outside. Mm-hmm. They don't, people don't want you to. Yeah. Because the moment you do that, you confuse them. Uh, yeah, so I, I worked for them for a good few films. Um, even went to Canada with them to shoot a TV series with them for that. Because what became very apparent very quickly was my knowledge was useful to them outside of just being the editor. Mm-hmm. Um, and the producer liked that because it filled in a few gaps for him. And I said, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Um, um, got Yeah, got taken to America and did that. And then I, that's when I started going, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I could do this. I want to be a director. Mm-hmm. And I got this guy contacted me and said, I've heard you're a great editor for fixing independent film project. I've got a project that's not working. I need an editor to fix it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, that's interesting that he's come around at the time I'm thinking I need to branch out. I'll meet him, see what he's got to offer. Anyway, what he was offering was pittance in money. But I made a deal with him. I said, look, if we do, if I do this for you and turn this film around, will you let me pitch you an idea for us to make a film together after? And he said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So I did. I mean, the film was awful. The film we worked on, the first film we worked on, that he asked me to fix was awful because it, it wasn't directed by me. It wasn't directed by somebody that really even wanting to be a director. Mm. She'd written the project and she was passionate about what she'd written. But she didn't understand what it was to be a director. And that's not her fault, you know, but she... um... There were some interesting things going on with that film as well. I remember, I can't remember the name of it. I I wouldn't want to say. Yeah, but but there were some interesting (laughs) things going on with branching, like, Z-list celebrities. Into the yeah, well, slotting this, them into the films. And, well, this is and what, using some what, names to push some, drive something forward. Uh, yeah, and when so, I say names, they were <laughs> they were the okay, biggest. Okay, so names. so the, here's the thing. All right, so hey, around that era of me moving into directing, two things was happening within the industry. So it's always been the case that um, distributors say they're only interested in three things when you make an indie film. Who's in it? who's in it and who's in it. And so knowing that you think, well, how am I going to get a named actor into my production? Yeah, yeah. The other thing to happen around that time was social media blew up, mm-hmm. blew up massively. And suddenly there were all these internet stuff. Yeah. And, um, and also there were things like big brother celebrities and stuff. Yeah. Who were making a name for yeah, themselves? Yes, so there was a different type of celebrity, celebrity and had, name. Had, yeah, name. And the industry, not just indie filmmakers, but the industry went, "Oh, would this benefit us to have these guys in our film? Because mm-hmm. they're cheaper than actors, and they're a name. They've got a following." And so, yeah, a few indie people, myself included, went. Okay, that's one way to do it then. If that's what you're asking for, that's what we'll give you. Yeah. So when I first made my first movie, my, my first movie was a thing called um, Dangerous Gang. Started out as a film called Name of the Gang, um, but the distributor changed the title. And quite wisely, I think Dangerous Games are better, better title. Mm-hmm. But, um, but the idea was that it was all based, um, the original idea was, Let's use Callum Best, who is George Best's son. George Best being the most famous footballer probably the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. Certainly the UK, because in the 60s he was known as the fifth Beatle. Mm -hmm. Don't know if you know that. Yeah, yeah. So um, the fifth Beatle, because in the 60s, on the front cover of every newspaper was the Beatles. And then you turn it over on the sports pages, there was George Best. Right. So he was, hence why he was the fifth Beatle, because mm-hmm. they, they would always be around every cover of every newspaper in the 60s. 
So here's George Best's son, who's not a bad looking guy, mm-hmm. who's been in front of a camera most of his life, on, even on things like Celebrity Big Brother. And I have access to him because he's previously been in this other film. Um, let's make a movie about him as a f- professional footballer mm-hmm. um, and put him in a football shirt and that will be our PR angle. And that's the whole point of that movie. Yeah. So we, I wrote this story. So it was very st- st- strategic. It was a, strate- <laughs> a strategic idea yes. because at this point I'd spent a bit of legwork trying to help this guy sell the other film that he'd made, mm-hmm. learning how the industry works, what they're looking for, and hearing the industry say, you must get famous people in your film. So I went, well, we'll write a thing about a famous person then. And we'll make this film mm-hmm. that will get, if nothing else, headlines of some description. Yeah. I'm sure of it. And it also helped with having the names bring other names into it as well, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, for example, because I had Callum Best, we got Chris Kamara. Mm. You know, and, and he said, I'm doing this because I love Joel. You know, and, and, yeah. and I want to give his son support. Um, and then we got a um, uh, a football, another football commentator, which was the the voice of, of Sky Sports, I think it was at the time. And he did it because it was he loved the concept, and mm-hmm. and, and it had, yeah, it had to this this huge knock on effect of, of people coming into the project. And this is my first feature film, and I'm like quite excited by yeah, yeah. the level of people we got coming in on it. Mm-hmm. And obviously you had a role in it as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had that. Um, and so I was, I was proud of it because I was like, I'm doing what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I've achieved something to a higher than I expected standard at the time because it was my first feature. And that was, and I was able to give you a role. And all of that, wrapped up in a, a thing that just made me go, this is great. Mm-hmm. This is my first attempt and it's working. I remember going up to, to Glasgow, actually, because I, was, I, was, well, I worked on River City up there. <laughs> and I was editing it in the evenings right. whilst I was working during the day. Because, of course, doing this independent film isn't making you any money. No. Is it? It's no, not, no, you're no. Not there get, is no money. You're not, you're no. not getting, you know, there's... There's potential and hope for the future, depending on where the film goes. Yeah. But at the time of doing it... I've got to still work on something else. You've got to be earning some money. Yeah, people think Mm. that indie filmmakers are sitting on a pile of cash. Yes, And you've already been paid. Yeah, no, the cash is at the end. Yeah, the cash is (laughs) very very much at the end, if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yeah. Yeah. So I'm working on River City, and uh, I'm working on it in the evenings. Um, on my own equipment, not on the, not on the BBC's equipment, I've got to add. Mm-hmm. And um, two of my m- most trusted sort of uh, editing mentors, if you like, happen to be working there on their own blocks of River City at the same time. Um, a guy called uh, Nigel Cattle and Adam Masters, both great editors, long, long standing editors. Um, who have done just about everything that I assisted for and then became a co-editor with and so on. So great relationship with them. But I knew I could trust them honestly as well. Mm. So I showed them the film. I said, look, would you mind watching my first attempt at directing? And they were like super impressed. They were like, okay, look, I think there's some things with the story that aren't great, but actually you've done some, phenomenal photography some you know some good acting in there you know as a first time director that's as good as if not better than some of the first time directors mm-hmm. that do tv drama and that's all i wanted to hear because i was like that's that's excellent uh, <laughs> but there was a huge still a huge learning curve within that and um you know here we are in a situation where a distributor says we've got to use a name. We use a name that they find acceptable initially because, and I'm not just talking about 
like Callum, because it may mm. seem like that. I'm talking about everybody that's that's involved because they're all reality stars or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then when we go back to the distributor with the whole game plan and the whole concept of it being, you know, a foot a famous football player's son working, um, pretending to be a professional footballer, premiership footballer, mm-hmm. they turn around and go, oh, actually, British gangster movies are doing really, really well at the moment, so we're going to scrap all the football from all our PR and we're going to put a gun in his hand on the front cover of the, 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 of the DVD. Mm-hmm. We're going to take away the football shirt, this and the other, you know, and, and, and I said, but hang on, who's, why would somebody watch a Callum Best gangster movie? Mm-hmm. I don't see the link. And they said, don't worry about that. That's for us to sell. And of course, it didn't sell very well. And of course, when it then got to being released, um, because it was sold on the basis of it being this gangster movie, which it never was, it had an element of gangster crime mm-hmm. in it, but that it wasn't a gangster movie. Um, because they missold it, I was tarnished with being a really bad director that should never have written this film. Mm-hmm. Now, it didn't bother me because the right, I got a write up in The Guardian, mm-hmm. a two page spread. Yeah, for your first, to, to get that, yeah. a write up in The Guardian, a national newspaper, yeah. for your first independent film, some people <laughs> would give their right arm for that, wouldn't they? Yeah, I got a, I got a write up in it. They absolutely slated me, but in the most fun mm-hmm. and enigmatic way, almost like, um, like your best mate would tease you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was set, written in such a way that you couldn't take offence at it. That actually, I think the guy who wrote it secretly liked the film, but knew that he couldn't say, yeah. you know, that he didn't like it. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, look. It isn't The Godfather. Yes, yeah. And my film was never trying to be The Godfather. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. So that's the context of the movie. You know, my, it was an independent movie that had people in it that were famous to this country particularly. See, I know you're trying to do this thing of creating the, the thing that the industry is asking for, but you... But within those movies, some of the leading men haven't been actors. They don't understand the process Mm -hmm. of what an actor should do at all. They don't Mm -hmm. understand the job that you're you're giving to them. Uh, See, I've had this before. Mm -hmm. What is an actor? What is an actor? Yeah. Right? Because... Because a lot of people say, oh, but you're not hiring a proper actor. Yes, yeah. So go on, tell me now, because I don't have the answer for it, uh, what is a proper actor? Okay, without sounding too funny, um, an artist, someone that interprets a role and a position and a, a place and space in time and portrays that and gives you a story. Um, it isn't just... Some actors do very well at being themselves. Yeah. Um, some actors do fantastically in being something else to give you that story. And a so celebrity and a normal person delivering lines won't ever truly be able so to give you, give you, because I've never seen it. But I have. So I have seen. So, and I can, I'll, I'll name one now. So Ricky Raymond from Tower. Mm-hmm. Okay. He's more known for being a celebrity because he's from Towie. Um, he came on our set and at first he wasn't that interested. I don't think he was that interested. Mm-hmm. He had a kind of a very chilled, laid back sort of thing about it. But I put him with a phenomenal actor, Gary Webster, who's now one of my business partners. And Gary took him under his wing. And within, literally within an hour, he turned him into an actor with a direction 
with a, 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 a way to perform that role to a standard that some so-called professional actors mm -hmm. can't do. And also, equally, I've seen, coming on to that, I've seen so-called professional actors, oh, yeah. people that have been to acting school, mm -hmm. that have been employed on 101 different shows and, and films and things, mm -hmm. who can't act their way out of a, out of a paper bag. Because yeah. they just, no matter how much they want to be an actor, they just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So, so I still, do, and those are the two reasons why I don't have an answer for what is a real actor. Because by saying that, okay, right, have you been like maybe I okay, I only take people that have been to drama school. Yeah, no, I'm not saying that at all. No, I'm, I know but, you're not. Yeah, but I've had people say to me, um, "Oh, you've you've only got to employ people from drama school because mm -hmm. only drama school people." Can no, I, uh, yeah. Now, I fundamentally disagree with that because most drama school teachers, most, not all, because mm -hmm. I'm generalising it, most drama school teachers teach for the state, which is great, but film and TV acting is a totally different beast, mm -hmm. as you know. And it's very hard for somebody that's been trained one way to change the way and take direction to act in a different way. Do you know what that comes down to? That comes down to a lot of the philosophies and teachings of acting mm. comes from an era even before TV. Yeah. So a lot of these ideals so come... doing the same Yeah, things. so there's not so many philosophies. A lot of the acting has been... A lot of the great actors that we see in TV and film now, um, that they didn't get taught a philosophy. They had a particular t tutor yeah. or teacher that, that, that is... Uh, a modern philosophy that isn't so widespread. Um, and it is, it's going to be a lot harder to, to find those good actors. And then, and a lot of it comes down to experience, doesn't it? Because, because of the, the way yeah. that they're taught. But, uh, but it, but it also comes down to, to being directed as well. Mm -hmm. There's a new, there's a new wave of performers coming. Now. Yeah. And, I've seen it not just when I'm directing, but when I've been on somebody else's set. Because um, I get, I visit other people's sets and still want to learn. So I still mm -hmm. see other, what other people are doing. There's a new thing that's happening. Somewhere along the line, somebody has told this new generation, and it's not one age group, by the way. I'm saying generation because they might be. Just, just entering it's, 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 the industry. Yeah, and you can enter the industry at any age. But this now. new generation are coming in where they think they all have to have an opinion about their own character. But not only that, how their character must interact with that character. And so that character has to change the way they're performing. Mm -hmm. And when you as a director step in and say, hang on, that's not the scene that we're doing here and when we rehearse this none of this was spoken about they suddenly get well that's how i want to do it and so that's how I, and suddenly it's a very offensive do you know i, I can so, I, do you know where i think that's coming from a lot of actors will now have a tutor on the side when they get a job right. so they'll get a job yeah. i know a few actors that they get a job and then they go to their tutor they yeah. rehearse all the lines and everything with their tutor that's separate to the production yeah. And then they go into the production and they can't adapt. They won't adapt. No. Yeah. I know. And it's wrong because yeah. there's only one chief on that film set mm -hmm. and that's the director. Yeah. And the director can argue with the producer, but really they'll only argue over budgets. Mm -hmm. The producer can talk about how they want things to be played and so on. But um, in general, a director is there to, to, to decide how the thing is to look and to feel and, and the whole creative ambiance of the piece. Um, but he shouldn't be arguing with the actors. Mm -hmm. and, and really, the actors should be taking the direction because at the end of the day, it is not them that will be noted in the newspapers. They all have a byline that says, that character did... 
didn't do great in this role because X, mm-hmm. Y, Well, and it's Z. the director's but vision, isn't it? always comes back to, mm-hmm. why did the director do it like that? What, you know, like, why did the director tell Margot Robbie yeah. to do this? Or, well, and I, and I often, you know, when I've done some things over the, over the years, and some, some people have gone, why did you do it like that as an actor? Because yeah. oh, the director wanted me to. Yeah. Because I could have done it a different way. I thought of different ways to do it. But at the end of the day, it's the director's vision. Yeah. It's the director's piece. And, that's... and you're there to do a job as an actor, as a performer, yeah. and, and relay that and be part of that vision. And you are right about these acting coaches because um, they've become this... Ah, uh, there's a word for it, but like a, a vicious sort of thing that's happened as well. Because I've a, I've actually had um, I did it have it on my last movie. I had an actor who went suddenly decided he was going to go to a voice coach and go to an acting coach. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Why?" I said, "I don't, I don't know. You've got the role. You've auditioned. You got the role. Mm-hmm. How you performed in the audition was perfect. Yeah. So should we stick with that and we'll build upon that?" between us as normal on a film on the film set. anyway he continued even though i sort of said don't he continued seeing him and um suddenly out of the blue i was getting all these cvs to my email address fire this acting coach and i was like oh, sorry what's what's this what's going on and he said well you know obviously because i've read the script I went, what? how have you read the script? He said, well, because I'm working with this actor, um, but you need this actress in it, you need this actor in it, you need to play this role, this role, because that they'll support him really well. Yeah. And I was like, well, no, we've, we've cast it. Mm. And then, he, then suddenly this guy just went mental over email, sending me hundreds of emails. Well, you're an unprofessional director. You don't know what you're talking about. Blah, blah. This, uh, this act has come back to me and said that you changed the way I told him to do this performance. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's an outside element that's coming into the industry, and I would guess it's coming in from a, a money-making point of view as a new, you know, because this yeah. person will be getting a, a fee, a fee yeah. and they will be presenting themselves to actors as, you need, you need me. You need me. You, I can yeah. protect you. Mm-hmm. I can make you look the best you can be yes yeah, yeah. yeah. I, i'm the only person in your corner mm-hmm. and it's um it's wrong it's yeah. so wrong you know? so so i think going to an acting because i'll never work with that actor again yes because of him yeah so i think going to an acting uh workshop or drama tutor is, is actually quite important it's part of it's part of the yeah. continuous training um, I sometimes like compare acting to like a sport, uh, like a runner. Oh. Uh, you can't just do the day of being on a film set. That's the race. Yeah. You can't just turn up for the race and expect to no. win. You have to do all the warm up stuff. Sure. And that's what the training is. But you can't have two different coaches for that, for that same race. Yeah. So what you've got to do is the moment you have entered into the race, mm-hmm. stick with one coach, which yeah. is the director of that. You know, yeah. film. Um, don't don't muddle yourself. Don't confuse it. Don't because it you really won't get the best out of your own performance, mm-hmm. and um, it will mess you up. And but it's it's just unbelievable how much time is now wasted with these nonsensical conversations because they come on set. They don't say somebody else has said this and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. They, what they do is they go, I have read this scene and I don't think I should say it like this. I think, you know, I don't think my character would do that. I don't think. And you kind of go, and it's, it's you can't, you go, but that's crazy because you don't think, the whole point about you being an actor is mm-hmm. they're somebody else's words. They're the character's words. They're not you because the argument is I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't do that. And it's like, well, no, you wouldn't, but you're, we've decided as the writers mm-hmm. isn't it, that you, this person does. So you don't and you're think playing that person. There's room for the actor to be part of the, 
because you spoke in the beginning how great it was that the film industry was this collective process. Yeah. That there's room in there for the actor to give opinions there and is. to give. No, there is. But not on every single scene, every single moment. Mm-hmm. Just because, because they start looking unprofessional and they start holding up the process so, and start feeling very and looking very self. You know what the professionals do? They do it before the shoot day. Yeah. They do it. They don't do it on set. They don't do it in front of oh, camera. Absolutely. It is part of the. It's, at it's the ta- a one to one. It's, it's the ta- It's yeah, the table read. The table you have reads, the table read. The rehearsals. Yeah. That's where you do and, the discovery. And if it's in TV, mm-hmm. and you're still not in liking what's in the script, the scripts change very very quickly. Yeah. You go up and speak to the bosses. You go up and speak to the bosses. But on the day, you're there. You do your job. You do the job. You just yeah. You just mm-hmm. you, you've got to that point. It's way too late yeah. at that point. And I, and I guess the thing that's is, what's... it doesn't change anything. Mm-hmm. This is the thing that everybody's got to understand. It doesn't matter what the actor says. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the director and then the editor is going to make it what they want to make it. Yeah. Because quite a lot can happen in the editing. So, you know, an actor can go on and on and on about how they feel about something, mm-hmm. but it can all get changed around. And so it really doesn't make any difference what he said. All it does is it just annoys people. The problem we had, um, and it's a particular problem with young men, the ego gets the better of them and they act like a diva mm-hmm. because they believe, I, in my opinion, they, they get scared and they think that by acting like a diva, it will cover up the fact that they don't think they've got the talent to pull this off. Um, and it doesn't really happen with women, with with female actors. Mm-hmm. It it does happen with with young men in particular, who are inexperienced or on a certain level of their career. Um. So yeah, so that's a that's an issue, really. Um, and it manifests itself then in different ways on all the films I've done. Like I say. You, I, I get this same, this same problem and this same issue. You know, you give somebody an opportunity, and effectively they throw it back in your face um, because it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for them to go. But it's a, it, it's, it's trends. You know, like I say, it's a trend that's happening at the moment. So, what do you think's next for the industry then? What does the future what, in look trends, like? Yeah, in the trends, because you've got this whole thing at the moment with the writers are striking, the actors yeah. are striking. AI is taking big well, leaps and bounds. So with the strikes, the interesting thing there is what happens with every strike scenario. You know, so so say public transport go on strike, the government go immediately gets their back up and go, well, we can't be held to ransom by these train drivers. Mm-hmm. So how can we circumvent train drivers? Okay, they don't think, yeah, because it never ever again solves the problem. They might get a small payroll, but never solves the problem to the extent they want. So the same thing is happening in our industry. Behind all the actors' backs, all the studios are going to the AI companies, of which there's only probably about two or three really good quality ones. There's a lot more cheaper ones, but Mm -hmm. the good quality ones. They're going to them. We cannot be held over a barrel by these actors. Mm-hmm. Um, how quickly can we get this AI so good that, you know, and how much money will it cost us to get us? So mm-hmm. That's what they're doing. So, yes, I look, I don't think AI will ever be as good as a human being acting. I think the emotion that a human being can give, and, but not only that, the reaction and the chemistry that can happen when you pair them with another human can create such magic on the screen that could never ever be replicated by a computer. Mm-hmm. But I do think that that this strike is not doing them any favours. Um, and there has to be another way around it. There has to be. Um, but I think that 
I think that AI will be a tool to be used in the industry. Um, I think that so long as it's a balance and it's used in the correct way, it could be a good tool. Mm-hmm. I think the fear for me is the the stifling of creativity, the death of creativity, that we're just handing that, because being creative is very important to me. Well, I think, and yeah, it's I important think, to everyone within the industry. I think that that's what will happen with the studio. Mm-hmm. They will just, because it's cheap. Because it's uh, the money-making side the of it, money the business. Mm-hmm. But perhaps that's not a bad thing for people like myself from the independent, because we won't be able to do that. And for the short term, what will probably happen is, and I hope this happens, that good quality actors can see that, hey, okay, the independent guys out there don't have the money for my talent. Mm -hmm. But they've got great products and projects, and I can show my talent off there, and an audience can still see what, and they can see that I'm not all about the money because mm-hmm. um, so many of these actors say they're not all about the money. They just want fairness for everybody. And it's like, well, okay, come, come to the independent world. Show what you can do. Mm-hmm. Give, us, give us the platform we so desperately need and go on. Yeah, yeah they, actually, this but, uh, could be a really great moment for independent filmmaking. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It? it could be. It could be the turning point that mm-hmm. indie film that indie film needs. needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and gets but you know let's not forget that there's been lots of great movies that have come around that were originally independent films mm-hmm. or low budget films you know train spotting full full monty so on you know they they were indies you know um yeah. indies with with good budgets but indie nonetheless um <clears throat> and the uh, the thing with with our my side of the industry is trying to find a different way to to skin that cat to to deliver mm-hmm. the next project that people want to do. So um, some colleagues of mine um, are working on um, the Winnie the Pooh series. Have you heard about uh, the horror? The horror. Yes. So. Disney lost the rights to to, to Winnie the Pooh yeah, the because public the copyright domain, yeah. came into the public domain. And genius, genius idea. The guy went, I'll make a Winnie the Pooh movie. Mm-hmm. I, I'll make it a horror. Then I, because it's a genre film, I don't have to put anybody famous in it mm-hmm. because genre films generally don't have famous people, famous faces in it. Winnie the Pooh is its own PR stunt. Anyway, because immediately everyone, all the papers will go. We need the poos to be made into a horror. Yes, yeah. Correct. So the so the studios will will it ticks all the boxes. So the distributors, the distributors, will buy it. yeah, yeah. So the distributors. Will. The problem is the execution. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not look on IMDb itself. It's had like twenty thousand reviews, and it's only got two stars. Well, when a film has that many people reviewing it. Mm-hmm. And that's the level of stars. You know the quality of the film. So, you know, and I'm not speaking ill of it. I'm yeah, just saying that. And I guess they've done something there where they've got an opportunity. I've seen that they've got the opportunity for more money for Winnie the Pooh too. And yeah. they're doing like Bambi the Horror next or something like that, I hear. Right. So the the, the business then, uh, right. So the business model is mm-hmm. is this for an independent film. You make a movie on spec on a low budget. Uh, and it's not my place to say what their budget was, but but their budget was was pennies in comparison to you know mm-hmm. an Avengers movie, say. Yes. Yeah. Um, they make it low, and then they pitch it and sell it. And of course, because of their game plan, it was sellable, and they sold it, and they sold it for I think it was about four times their budget. So they grabbed it with both arms. Mm-hmm. But what happened was the people they sold it to, the distributor, went. Well, we're going to put PR behind this. So they spent the same amount of money again on PR Mm -hmm. around the world. And that immediately meant that it was getting a worldwide fan base. And it made a lot of money. I think um, it was like five million. 
So the distributor came straight back to the production company and said, right, we now want Winnie the Pooh 2, Bambi, uh, Cinderella, uh, I can't remember what, they, they, there's a whole... There's basically any, any, anything that's in public domain, let's yeah, get it and use it and do it the same thing. And do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so, so that's what this company is now doing. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, there are a lot of haters because they're like, oh, you're killing a classic and so on. Yeah, sure. um, but, but the business model was sound. Mm-hmm. And you have to congratulate them for that, you know. Um, according to the people I know who are working on the second one and so on, they're, they're, they're saying no, they're they're putting the money um, in bet. You know, the, the the quality of the production is going to be a lot lot better mm-hmm. for the second one and so on. So they they're putting the money in the right places and on the screen. But it's um, it's what if all of us are indie filmmakers want to do we're all looking for that way in so coming back to your thing about well playing the game sort of thing and giving them what they want you have to you have you can't just say i've got a great idea and i'm going to make it you do you are playing on their terms Mm -hmm. it's their agenda it's their agenda their terms you have to fit your product to what they want to buy um so yeah, so if they want, you know, and, and they want it, they want at the end of the day a sure thing. Yeah, they, they don't. They don't. Right? Yeah, they don't. Yeah. They don't want to. They want to see things that have worked before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, so or have got a very a unique hook. Yeah. yeah. So there are millions of these. Um, there are millions and millions of indie films made by mm-hmm. people all the time, and a very small percentage of them ever see the light of day. <clears throat> But it can be done if you know the business of the film business, because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a business first, you know. It's art second, unfortunately. Um, And it took me a while to learn, but I learned it and I understand it. And I'm able to... I think I'm able to put together now a project that will fit most distributors' wants and needs quite quickly because I've got lots of creative ideas on all different genres. But not only that, I now have the context as well because mm-hmm. I've, done, I've done five of my own feature films. Um, I've got... Um, so this is what's happened now. So basically, I, I've worked on these five features. I made one uh, last year that's still being finished in post-production now. With the people I made the one last year with, we put it together a whole brand new company called Royal Flush Production. And it was, now I understand the business of it. I went, right, I need a few key elements to this company. First of all, I need to give investors um, great opportunities to get their money back out of my film. So I am now one of the very, very few film companies that the government has given EIS status to. What does that mean? So EIS is granted to any new company, not film industry but a new company that wants in private investment and you have to apply for it and they look through all your everything you are stating about your company and effectively EIS gives an investor 30% of if they're a UK taxpayer gives them as a safety net 30% of their investment back in their income tax. So, for example, if they invested £10,000, <clears> then on their next tax return, they can deduct £3,000 from their income, which means they've only risked £7,000. If my company goes under, then the government will pay them another 30% back. 
meaning they have now gone down to, so I think it's something like 28,000, um, 2.8 thousand pounds that they only risk. Mm. Also, if they sell their shares after the three years, they don't pay capital gains on it. So if the company is successful, not only do they earn profit back in the form of a dividend, but also they don't, when they sell the shares, they don't have to pay any um, capital gains tax on it. So they, so I have set up a great way for investors to feel comfortable that they're not just relying on the films that I'm making to invest in the company. Mm -hmm. So that was the first. Second thing I knew was I knew I needed some key figures in my company to help make it a success. So I have um, a couple of key people. I have uh, Gary Webster, who's a famous British TV actor. He used to be um, Arthur Daly's nephew in Minder. And he's also been on EastEnders and Family Fest. But he's, he's just say he's been around the block is an mm. understatement you know he's well known within the industry and so he has great connections to other actors and so on other than also he's a phenomenal talent he's a fantastic character actor mm -hmm. and of late extremely under you so he'd worked for me a couple of times i approached him and i said look would you like to be part of this company would you like to do what you do best but also bring in actors so he's involved well, i also work with a great new up-and-coming actress who um her name's molly hansen who comes from a dynasty of great performance because her mother is samantha bond who was piers brosnan's miss money penny mm -hmm. um and she's been in downton abbey and things like that and her father is a great theatre actor called Alex Hansen. But beyond that, her grandmother was um, a producer as well. And she was the person that brought um, Agatha Christie to the to TV screens first. Mm -hmm. So she convinced the Christie estate to, to release the rights for them to make. So, so she has a good long standing within the industry, or her family does. Mm -hmm. And she has acting in her blood. So um, it made sense to me to bring her on board and be part of the company. But then I know that, so that was like a creative side dealt. Then I had to deal with the business side now, if you like. Mm -hmm. So I brought on board two people. I brought an entrepreneur billionaire in board, a guy called Alfie Best, who's owned multiple businesses but has made his money mainly being the UK's biggest landlord um, because he owns um, retirement parks right across the country and now branching into America. Um, mm -hmm. He owns over 120 sites. Something. Um, so he knows business. And, um, you know, when I showed him my business model, he liked it. But he tweaked it and he said, now we've got a phenomenal business. And then, and then the other person that I brought on board was a, was a guy that um, we call him, his professional term is line producer. Right. But the term we <laughs> fondly call him is the fixer. Okay. Because if I need a car at 5 a.m. in the morning, mm -hmm. He'll find me a car to film in at 5 a.m. in the morning. You know, after we're all tired, knackered, and the original car didn't turn up, he'll, he'll find one. If I need a uniform in, you know, a police uniform to film somebody in, suddenly there will be one on set, no question. He just manages to get whatever I need whenever I need. Um, he's also an up-and-coming actor as well, so, you know... Um, I brought him on board to do that. So we now have a team of five strong people as part of this company, the investors, the distributors, and the people within the industry will all feel comfortable working, you know, because there's my experience of, of being in the industry 30 years and now making five feature films. And that name of 
doing that carries so far. Mm -hmm. But having these other people involved in different areas of of life uh, and the industry just makes so much sense to other people because they go, oh, you've got that person involved. Oh, I'm more than happy to be involved. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to be an investor on one of your films? Okay, so investors get involved for various different reasons. Firstly, some investors do it because they invest money in things like property or stocks and shares and stuff, but they then find that a bit boring. Mm-hmm. You know? um, so they like the idea of investing. They know that money makes money, so they want to do something different, and I am something different. So that's that's um, one of the reasons why investors come to us and, and work. If they want, they are more than entitled to come on set and have set visits and meet cast and stuff like that. If they own a company with a product, we're happy to put sponsorship into the film for them and show them what what the, the um, what we as a worldwide platform Mm -hmm. can do for their product and they can have like you know uh seconds and minutage with famous faces using their product you know product placement the product placement yeah Yeah, exactly um but that will that's we don't sell it as that you know it's 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 investment and of course then the big one is they get they get to come to the premiere the red carpet premiere and we always have uh, a leicester square premiere Mm-hmm. Um, with a red carpet and so on. So it's uh, it's more. It's not just about the money that they're putting in and no. what the return on that money will be. It's the it's the experience that it's the experience. Yeah. It's the is a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. It's um. But but you, and the opportunities that could come from it as well. Yeah. That it could lead to it could might wouldn't necessarily just be that one movie that they've invested in. It's what, it's no. potentially what comes next. And, and actually, the way we've restructured my company. Um, is we've made sure they're not investing in one. And what I mean by that is, so it, if I get a particular investment from a from an investor, they're investing in my company, not in the film. And that's a huge difference to every other filmmaker out there at my level mm-hmm. because they're all asking for money for their one film. I'm asking money to go into the company. Now, when I reach a certain level, yeah, I'll go straight into production to make that first movie. But whilst I'm making that movie, I'll be looking for new investors to make the second movie. And if the second movie still does well, because the first lot of investors have invested in the company, they'll get money from the second movie Mm -hmm. as well. So it won't ever end for the life of the company. They will always get paid back. so it's uh, investing with us is a, a really good, solid idea. I, I can't say I guarantee you're going to win, but I've done everything within my power to make sure it's a solid investment. So where does that investment start? It does it start at I've got a th- I've got a thousand pounds I'd like to save from the tax man or to be to like... be honest, no. So to be honest, it's the minimum is five thousand. To get the benefits of EIS, you have to be what they call a high worth individual. Would the people that are looking to invest understand this EIS already? Uh, no, probably probably most people haven't heard of it. Okay. A lot of a lot of people, a lot of these high worth individuals that I often see and me because part of my, a lot of my job now is going to bars, going to going out in the evening, going to meals, meeting networking, people, networking. Because yeah. mm-hmm. I get introduced to people, they introduce me to other people and so on. A lot of those people I speak to, now they don't, they've heard of the IS, but they think it's a scheme and they think it's dodgy or they think, you know, because the word schemes come with connotation. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, it really isn't. All it is is that it is a, um, it's a government-backed, um, way to bring investment into young companies um, in young this country as well. Coming countries, yeah, in this country. Yeah. I mean, different countries have different similar mm-hmm. similar things. But 
you know, at the end of the day... Yeah, it's not a tax avoidance scheme. Oh, it's no, a no. government... Pol- <clears throat> no, it's almost like the, a go- the, government policy. The problem is that EIS was... Um, EIS was used as a tax avoidance scheme um, a few years back in the film industry. There was a, a, a famous case of a group of footballers by a certain accountancy firm that twisted the rules of EIS and meant that uh, they got footballers off of a lot of income tax. Then they got found out, <clears throat> and HMRC, instead of blaming those accountants, they blame the film industry. Mm-hmm. And for a long, long time, and this is the reason why my company is one of the only companies that has EIS. For a long, long time, the film industry wouldn't give EIS out to any film company. Mm-hmm. And it took me about three years and four attempts to apply for it. But I wouldn't give up. I mm-hmm. knew it was one of the keys to my company, new company's success. Yeah. And I got it. Eventually I got it. I got it with, you know, certain things that I I said in my um application, certain tweaks to the business model and and getting the right people involved, people like Alfie and so on who are recognized um business entrepreneurs, you know, with, with great track records within within the business community and income generating mm-hmm. sources so you know getting those <clears throat> correct things in place are what are going to make this company a, a huge success for the film's second you know because <clears throat> now that i've got all that in place it's going to be easier to make the films a success because mm-hmm. they don't have to be that big a success for the investor to either break even or to make their money back because yeah. I've already had a third of it back. Mm-hmm. How does that feel to be in this position in your career right now? It's great. It's, it's good. Um, it's come at a good and a bad time. So we have an, a worldwide um, financial crisis, mm-hmm. which has made everybody with any capital go, right, I'll put it in the bank and lock it away which is the wrong thing to do, in my opinion, because the only way we'll ever get out of a financial crisis is to spend. Mm -hmm. Spend money to make money. Yeah, (laughs) to lock it away in a bank, it's just going to disappear. Nothing's going to happen. But everyone's very frightened. But everyone's cautious, and I get it, and I understand Mm -hmm. it. So I've got the right tools to help people make money, but people, you know, I'm finding it harder to get people to invest at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so, there's, so there, is, there is that. But things are still moving. I've still got a lot of things coming up. I've got, um, I've got a couple of very, very big players um, about to get involved in a couple of projects that we want to get off the ground in the next year or so. Um, I have made great friends with the um, Birmingham and TV film organiser and they've invited me up to go and pitch three ideas to broadcasters in this um, event that we do every year. So we've got that coming up. So um, by hook or by crook, I think that by the end of the year, um, I will be saying publicly, this project is being greenlit and we go into production early next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of things to line up, but I genuinely believe that's, that's what's going to happen. And to be in that situation from where I came from to where I am now, you know, I know that one of my movies will be a success mm-hmm. and the headline will be overnight success. Richard Colton does great with blah, blah, blah. Well, that overnight success has taken 30 something years mm-hmm. to get there. You know, it's, and it's a slog, yeah. a daily slog. What I'd like to, to do is come, come back to this conversation at some point when, when that film's coming together. Right. Do you think we could do that? Yeah. And have a chat about the actual coming together of the, the early days of the film, like sure. that pre-production moment. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have another conversation about that as that happens towards the end of this year. 
Um, but I was thinking about, um, on that note of what you just said, is it of your journey over this 30 years and you are going to be that overnight success at some point, what advice would you give to someone entering the industry right now? Entering the industry now is, okay, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting period because you can make a movie on an iPhone and cut it on a computer in your bedroom. You can. But don't expect that movie to be the best new thing ever that everyone's going to go nuts about, that it's going to make you millions and blah, blah, blah. Don't expect that because the chances are, or well, everything's against you. Like Everything's against you for that. You're not going to get a big named actor in it unless they're your cousin. Mm. You're not going to get, you know, uh, the great visuals that your writing may need. The writing might not be as good as you think it is either. You know, there's lots of things and elements against you, and especially if you're doing it all on your own. However, that said, I do still believe in just do it, but I also believe in gaining experience. So get experience on sets as a run. Take the hard knocks because there will be hard knocks. Take the, the sort of the bullying and the ribbing because it's all done in good taste, but it's all part of the, the growing up and the learning about the industry. Take the shouting when the DOP stressed at you, you know, to take all of that because it's a learning curve mm-hmm. and absorb it like a sponge, you know, because the worst thing in the world is coming into these jobs believing you know it because you were taught it by one person at your uni with with that mindset you know go into these things believing that here's just another another way to do it and over time you know over time, learning from professionals and gleaning what it is they do and why they do it, you know, start piecing together your own style and your own identity within the industry, whatever that may be. That doesn't mean to say you can't just make something, just do it, because you've got iPhones, you've got lights, you've got you know, and by lights, I mean you can set torches up to give you atmospheric lights. You get, you know, you can do post production on a computer and so on. And then you've got these great platforms to show it off YouTube and so on. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and if they gain a following, because they do, you know, then you can build on that. But it's still, I think, you know, you will still become successful if you put it in hand in hand with a bit of professional back. So just starting an experience, bring those bring two, th- bring those things together yeah. and that will drive you forward. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. <laughs> well, I really, I really appreciate you joining me. That's all right. On this podcast. <laughs> we'll see you <laughs> at the next family barbecue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, see you in two weeks. Must be weird two, talking see, to your brother. <laughs> see you in two weeks and, uh, yeah. <laughs> see you in two weeks and, uh, and we'll do part two in a couple of months. Yeah. When the, when the next production starts. That's it. Nice, Richard. Good Thank you. you. All right, dude. Thanks, mate. Appreciate <laughs> right, it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting thing there that, that, uh, I tried to wrap this up and uh, you, you, you have more to say. <laughs> yeah, I know. Couldn't believe it. No. So uh, we're not finished. That's, it's not over. <laughs> no. So um, the post credit seats thing. So no, I remembered you asked me what else do I think for the future? And the bigger thing I think that the, over AI, because we started talking about that, I don't really have any thoughts about AI really. The bigger thing for me is streaming. Now, streaming has killed DVD, Mm -hmm. totally killed it. There's just no point bringing anything out anymore. Although I think DVD and Blu-ray will have a revival later down the road. Uh, Kind of like LP. Yeah, 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 LPs are on the come. Because I think people will start to miss the physicality of owning something. I do. I've still kept all my, I had a huge collection of DVDs and I've kept them in the loft. It does take up a lot of space, but I do miss that that right. physical item that goes with 
the film. The film. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. But there's something else that's really interesting. Cinema has had a massive, massive bounce back. Mm -hmm. It kind of started with sort of the Marvel movies. Then it became hugely big with Top Gun. But now we're seeing it with films like Barbie and mm. Oppenheimer. You know, there's this, there's this wave now of uh, post-COVID that people want to go back to the cinema. And it's partly to do with, I believe, streaming. What's happened is that streaming has just gone in there like a bull in a china shop and gone, right, we're going to take over and we're going to have content, we're going to have content, we're going to have content. And suddenly, all the other channels, any other forms of entertainment, you've now got to have one of everything mm. to view anything. So if Disney make it, you have to have Disney. If Paramount make it, you Well, have actually, to have these companies are now struggling. Netflix has had a massive drop. Disney, yeah, Plus, has, well, Disney Plus have had a massive drop in subscribers. They're, people are the dropping off. The problem is because you cannot compete. Mm-hmm with everybody all the time. There's too many of them. See, but before, a film would sell, its, would sell itself to a channel, mm. you know, and different, these different distributors would, you know, so Disney to... And it even sell. felt like it was working quite nicely when there was just Netflix. Yeah. Didn't it? But they all wanted to copy what Netflix yeah. was doing, but, you know, and they had the pick of all the best films and everything, but now there's all these other studios doing mm -hmm. all the streaming services yeah. they're struggling interestingly the one that's going to really sort of bounce i think back but it's all to do with money is apple tv mm -hmm. apple tv has the biggest war chest for making stuff and anybody with a new script is all going to apple tv to say make this make this do you want to buy this do mm -hmm. you want to buy this because they're the ones with the cash flow because apple aren't just about TV and no. films, they're mm -hmm. about iPhones, they're about computers and mm -hmm. so on. So they've got the backing to, to so. so there is this kind of thought that in the future the biggest streaming service will be Apple. Because mm -hmm. the the others will get knocked out of the water. But but what the question should be is is, you know, for the future of filmmaking, what happens when all these streaming services disappear? when they've knocked each other out, mm. you know, like, will it then, will we go back to having some kind of physical disc or will we be going, no, we want just one service that we all subscribe mm. to and so on. How, how will that come about? And then, you know, what will that look like for, for people like me, for the independent world? Yeah. Because at the moment, if I want to, I can self-distribute on Amazon. I can put my movies on there and, you know, with the right, you know, if I get the right publicity, people can buy it mm -hmm. um, or watch it. But um, so there is a platform for me. But if that gets knocked out of the water or Netflix gets, you know, where do I sell my stuff to? And it's very, very hard to get things on at the cinema, which is the only real alternative. It can be done and you can hire, you, you can do what's called day and date mm -hmm. where you literally go and privately rent screens around the country mm -hmm. and, may, you know, and, and to the audience, they just go, oh, look, there's a new film out. You know, they don't know the difference. Yeah, yeah. But um, you're just renting the screen, basically. So, yeah, so that's... that's, that's so maybe there's, a, there's an opportunity for there for a new model yeah, I I think I think so. I think I think that the I think we're on very shaky ground at the moment with having you know everybody having to have six different streaming services. Mm. It worked. Well, during... I, I've I had six at one point, right? And I've cancelled all six now. Yeah, it worked during yeah. COVID because we were all stuck we were all indoors, stuck and that's where the, that's where I had all six. Yeah. and yeah, and I had to to get rid of them all because it's just not it's just yeah. not a viable. It's no, not viable charging, for anyone. They're charging way, way, way too much for it. For it. Yeah. You know, if it comes down to a lot cheaper, perhaps, but um, as it currently stands, no, people people won't be able to keep, mm. keep that many streaming services. And I guess something needs to be done because I've also seen the return in piracy. 
piracy is making a big comeback. Which we'd beat. Mm. We'd beat some piracy. There was no reason for piracy. But now, because you need all these separate different platforms, it's like, well, if I'm a fan of Star Trek, I don't really want to have to pay for Paramount because I'd already paid for Netflix. Mm. You know, and and Star Trek used to be on Netflix. So, you know, it's that kind of mentality. So it's like, oh, but that guy down the pub, he's, he'll, you know, or that uh, download that I can yeah, get. Or that, or that website that's, yeah, you know, yeah. that they just keep changing the, the dot .com on the end of it. And, yeah, and I can yeah. get it that way. So, no, absolutely. And, 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 and piracy does, at the end of the day, it might seem like a harmless thing in the moment. Oh, but it's so does But it's, it's... Piracy it, kills me yeah. as an indie filmmaker. Mm. You know, the people... People yeah, it doesn't. It's not. It's not harming. You know, it's it's scraping off very minimal from the people at the top. Yeah, but everything from the ones at the bottom. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So when you get people going, well, why did you even bother making that movie? It was a load of rubbish. Yeah. Okay, you do sometimes go. Well, how did you see it? You know, did, you know, and then they go, well, actually, I downloaded it from a, and you're like, well, why? Did, why did you expect? Like, why my film didn't have the budget it deserved? Mm. Or the, you know. It's because you're not supporting it properly. Um, and there is something to be said for supporting film, music, all the arts properly, you know, yes, yeah. people's lives. But that's the, biggest, that's the biggest change in the future of TV film. Mm-hmm. But the one that surprised, it didn't, I predicted it actually. Cinema, I predicted. Because my, my, f- my fear for cinema is when the Disney cinema chain opens. That you right. can only go to the cinema to watch a Disney film, Marvel, Star Wars. Right. Because they've capitalised that. Yeah. And you don't see them, you don't see those true cinema, like a true cinema film. Yeah. That's made by filmmakers. You don't see that anymore. You just see... A pro- you just see the, the spectacle, yeah, the, the products, the, summer the blockbusters. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. No, that, I get it. I, I get it. Because I do like those things. Yeah, I do enjoy the Marvel and the Star Wars, but I also enjoy a real cinema. Yeah. No, listen, I, 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 I agree. But here's the thing: human beings aren't. This is why, for me, the pandemic doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Human beings are not designed to be on our own. And after the 1920s pandemic, immediately after the three years of isolation that everybody Mm -hmm. was forced to go through, that's why you had the Roaring Twenties, because they all came out and wanted to mix with people and socialise with people and and go to theatres and so on. And I said during the the pandemic, and I might have even said it to you, I said, you watch, cinema will bounce back afterwards. Everyone will want to get out and mingle with people again. It mm-hmm. will be, it's in us. It's, it's, you can't stop. So that's why, um, that's one of the reasons why cinema has had this massive review. Mm-hmm. And it has been mo- mo- monumental. When you look at the figures of like Barbie yeah. and Top Gun and so on, and they're just breaking all the time now. The next big film that yeah. comes out breaks another box office record, breaks another. Box. Um, you know, and, and good on it, you know, great, because these, there are, you know, some great films being made for the cinema. Mm. Oh, there's something I should have, that I don't, I'm surprised I haven't told you yet. I had a really great cinema experience last night. Okay. I went to the IMAX yeah. and watched Jurassic Park okay. in 4DX at the okay. IMAX. The, the 30, it was the 30th anniversary of when Jurassic Park came out, 19, right. came out in 1993. And I, I must have seen that film somewhere between 10 and 50 times, maybe, you know, it's in one of, okay. it was, that was a big film of mine. It's my, one of your faves. And, it's one of my yeah. favourite films. It was, you know, I was 10 yeah. when that film came out. Yeah. And that, that was. Well, it's ma- a landmark movie. It was You've a landmark. seen dinosaurs. On yeah, there. it was a landmark movie. It was, you know, and when I watched it last night, I went, that was Spielberg at his best. You know, that was, he'd, re- he'd peaked. He'd kind of, you know, I feel like that was a peak for him. It was the cinematography brilliant, but I've never seen that film in the cinema. Okay. Because of how young I was when it, when came, it, came, out. When it came out. Right. And seeing it at the cinema on the big screen, 
I was just, it was like seeing it for the first time. Well, this is what cinema does. Cinema is... Just completely absorbed in it. I didn't have any moments where I went, that comes next, this comes next, or... Right. Yeah, I was just captivated but by see, this So this is the thing, and, and I also think part of that is because you get enveloped by the emotions of everybody else around you. Yes. While they're watching. The community experience within yeah, that yeah, film. Yeah. So when people go, <gasps> yeah. and they jump at the T-Rex coming out, yeah. it's uh, everyone does it yeah. all at once. Or when there's a laugh, everyone, every, everyone, every, everyone yeah, so laughs, that. which you don't get when you're sitting on your sofa at home watching it. No, you might still fact, appreciate the film. You might you still do, enjoy but, it, but, but but what happens as well is that you look down at your mobile phone, mm. like the amount of people now that will yeah. have a TV on, and be doing that with Facebook. Or yes. Or oh, so so here's a question for you then. So something that I'm hearing being talked about a lot is that the studios are going for movies that are what they're calling second screen performances. Right. So they're expecting you, they're, they're, giving you, they're giving you an entertainment form that is the second screen. They, they expect your first screen to be your phone, and what they're giving you on the screen is right. the second screen. So it has to hit certain beats, and it has to have elements of fun that will engage you, mm. but also a story that's not too, too eng engaging. That you can do this. Well, that just sounds like a poor excuse for, for, for bad for filmmaking. Bad film. Yeah. Me. That just. Well, this well, this seems to be the a lot of the talk behind what's going on with like all the Star Wars TV series and how they're right. some of these programs they're, they're becoming very watered well, down. And what they could, I think, they're just running out of ideas. Yeah. What that could have been, what thing. could have been a film like the Obi Wan series? I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. yeah. That could have been an out ninety minute film. They stretched out over. Eight hours. Yeah. And yeah. so that's where this theory's coming that they're going, well, I could just play this game and. And catch up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I think you're, I think, I think you're right. But I don't think we should ever make things as a second experience. Mm -hmm. I think we should be making, striving to make the best we can possibly make. Because what's the point? Yeah. What's what's the point? You shouldn't be able to take your eyes away from from something. And a great movie will do that. A great movie will captivate. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be a movie. It can be a documentary. It can be whatever it is has got to hook you in and keep you engrossed. And um, you know, and and, and this is yeah, I want to come back to AI. That's that's the problem. I think you're going to have that AI. I don't think it's going to have a heart and soul. I don't think it's going to hook into the human thing. I will often pull in an actor to work with another actor and the performances will be like a tennis match mm -hmm. where they, they literally will out act each other and the performance level will, will grow on each of each one. Now, and you just watch the scene. I'm I, I had it with, um, I had it on my last film with, um, Gary Webster and Mark Williams from Harry Potter and the Far Show. And the two of them were in a scene. It was a very, very straightforward, simple scene. But the way the two performed it, at the end, I was just like, I gave them a round of applause because the way it was just great. And then I was like, and it was only one scene. I only had the one scene with the two of them in in the whole movie. And I was like, Oh my God, can I go and write five more scenes just <laughs> to have you both in it together? That won't happen with AI. That just simply won't happen. It, that, that magic, that spark will disappear mm. because it will all come down to effectively being a comic book or a, a cartoon, you know, where just the pictures are drawn and the words are said and, and so on. It's uh, it maybe it may be because it uh, maybe that will be all right because it is second entertainment. Maybe the audience have mm. shot themselves in the foot by not paying it. Yeah. You know. But, yeah. 
<laughs> well, thanks again, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. see you on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> or in five minutes with another guy. <laughs> that was the BTS Creative Academy podcast, Uncut. I appreciate you joining us for this conversation. If you'd like to drop into more conversations, just search the BTS Creative Academy podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And to make sure you don't miss any future episodes, don't forget to like and subscribe.